Mai, Haere Mai Ke Hahi Holy Trinity, Richmond Online. If we've not met before, my name is Zane Elliott, I'm the Vicar or Senior Minister of the Anglican Parish of Richmond. It's my joy to welcome you to this disrupted way of gathering today as we continue to dig into the book of Genesis together as a church family. If you've missed the last couple of sermons, you can find those on our website to get up to speed with the series so far. Now, this week we've moved very quickly from life feeling pretty normal to life feeling very different. This time last week we were meeting face to face with no restrictions and today we are meeting on screens. The world around us changes very rapidly, especially in these times which are so deeply impacted by coronavirus. In all of that change, it is a great comfort to be able to come to the Lord Jesus at a time such as this and be reminded that he never changes but remains the same. His love for us remains constant. He's given us the provision of his Holy Spirit to help us. That is certain. And the forgiveness that we receive in Jesus is assured. So whether you're feeling anxious about life in level four, or like my children, you're jumping up and down at the idea of a different pace of life for a while, I hope that today you will be encouraged in your faith as we open God's word and come to him in prayer and sing his praises. Before we read a sentence of scripture together, why don't we pray? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you've made us in your image and that you know each one of us. Today, would you minister to us in the midst of our messiness and the messiness of the world around us? You know our joys and our fears. Help us so to hear your voice that our fears are dispelled and our joys made even more complete in the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, the sentence of scripture this morning comes from John chapter 8 verse 44. And Jesus was talking to a crowd of Jewish believers who had their assurance in being descendants of Abraham, not in faith in God. And he was calling them to believe in him and to live the way of his heavenly father. I've chosen it for us this morning because it helps reveal something of the character of the enemy of God, Satan, who we're going to consider in the sermon today. So let's say together now the sentence of scripture. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Why don't we pray? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for today. We'll pray that together as well. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give than we either desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, as a way of singing together to sing God's praises, we're going to join in that amazing hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling.
must find the promised rest. Take away the love of singing Alpha and Omega P, and of faith as its beginning set our hearts at liberty. In confessing our sin, we acknowledge that we have failed to be the people God calls us to be. We know that our lives don't match up to the glory of God. In weakness, we yield to temptation instead of trusting that God's way is best. Sometimes we choose to spurn God's word, and we sin deliberately. Sometimes we harm others with our words and actions, acting in ignorance, but sinning all the same. Almighty God, your word reveals to us our state before you. As it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So now in a time of silence, let's allow the Spirit of God to search our hearts and bring to mind our sin. We have become worthless because of our sin. Yet our God is the same God who always has mercy upon us. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Therefore, responding in faith with confidence and trust that your word is true and your promises are sure, we confess our sin. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. We rejoice in God's goodness to us. This is a true saying and worthy to be received that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If anybody sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. 
He is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Though we were slaves to sin, we have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your great mercy promised forgiveness to all who truly repent and turn to you in faith, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sin. We know that those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Give us that desire, that we might live holy and upright lives before you. Amen. Well, this is a song I was hoping to introduce this week at our 10.30 service, and we're going to introduce it and learn it here instead. It's called The Hymn of a Saviour. Well, in just a moment, we're going to have our Bible readings for this week and then the sermon. But before we open God's word, 
Why don't we pray? Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise that you are not a silent God, but you have spoken to us by your Son. Thank you for revealing yourself to us perfectly in the Holy Bible. We pray today that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to hear you speak in your word, preserved for us through the ages. We ask it in Jesus' name, so that we might be shaped to be more like him. Amen. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running, and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. A reading from Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit in the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was, that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. In the first week in the book of Genesis, we saw that God created everything from nothing by his powerful word. He made everything in the universe in perfection and order. And God made people in his own image we were given a glimpse of the amazing pattern of blessing that God gave, where he set the seventh day as a day of rest, as that reminder that we are not God, that our power is not unlimited, that we are not self-sufficient, that we must take rest and we must rely on God's goodness to sustain us. Then last week we zoomed right in on the activity of God in creation. We thought about how the prohibition not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a platform for us to trust God's word. And we saw that beautiful oneness between the first man and woman who lived in a perfect one flesh relationship. Verse 25 of chapter 2 was the culmination of creation. 
the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. It's a beautiful picture of the innocence of perfect relationship between a man and a woman, just as God intended it to be, in his good and perfect created order. But unfortunately, that perfection was not to last. In verse 1 of chapter 3, there's a new character on the scene. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. We know from Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 that this serpent is the great enemy of God. It is Satan. He was cast down to earth from heaven for leading a rebellion against the Lord. And now he comes to recruit Adam and Eve, the first people, to join with him in that rebellion. As we consider that act of rebellion today, we're going to focus on two key areas. Firstly, we'll consider the tactics employed by the enemy of God to tempt God's people to turn their backs on him. And then secondly, we'll think about our great hope in the Lord Jesus, who overcame temptation and lived a life of perfect obedience and the help that that gives us as his people today. Before we dive in, why don't we pray? Father God, we thank you that we are able to open your word today. Help us as we examine the truths you've laid before us, so that we might become more like the Lord Jesus. Help us to understand the way the devil tempts us to rebel against you, and give us the strength to look to the Lord Jesus and to follow his example. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, we've already seen that the serpent enters into the Garden of Eden, and we know his intention. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 5 that he comes like a lion looking to devour. His goal is to kill, and ultimately he wishes to separate people from their God. In order to fulfill that aim, he comes to the woman Eve, and he poses her a question. Did God actually say that you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Here we see the first tactic of the enemy. He questions the word of God. Last week in chapter 2 verses 16 and 17, we saw how God spoke to Adam and he said, You may surely eat any tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you will surely die. God's word to Adam was absolutely crystal clear. But now the devil comes and he makes God's word, his plain and straightforward command, a matter for debate. He doesn't openly deny the word of God, not at first anyway. He opens up a debate about its meaning. Eve replies in verse 2. But notice she doesn't reply accurately. She is 90% of the way there but she adds to the word of God. In chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, there is no mention of touching the fruit. Now, whether Adam has passed on the injunction inaccurately or not, we don't know. But Eve doesn't know the word of God sufficiently well enough to be able to rebuff Satan when he comes and challenges God's command. In her reply, her modification of God's word, she also softens the likelihood of the penalty that God has given. God was explicit in his words. He said, if you eat this fruit, you will surely die. But Eve's rendering is noticeably different. She says, lest you die. It's like saying we might die or perhaps we'll die. Her recall is without the certainty which came from the word of God, where the penalty of death was explicitly guaranteed if Adam and Eve were to rebel. The devil has caused Eve to question the plain meaning of the word of God, and he's exposed her lack of understanding that what God says is always true. Our enemy uses the same tactic today. He comes and he questions us about the word of God. He invites us to rebel when he asks questions like, Did God really say that what you do in the privacy of your own bedroom matters? Did God really say that you should give away the hard-earned money that you've worked for? Did God really say that all people are made in his image? Did God really say... 
that even your terrible sin could be forgiven. In a myriad of ways, God's enemy tries to cause us to doubt the word of God and its plain meaning. But he doesn't stop there. In verses 4 and 5, we see that he continues with his attack on the word of God. Now he moves on from questioning the word of God and its plain meaning to distorting it with flat-out lies. Look at verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan distorts the word of God. In the devil's smooth words, he tries to deny that there will be any judgment for wrongdoing. And Eve has to decide who she will trust. Will she trust God's word, or will she trust Satan's word? Sadly, the denial of the word of God is a default position in the world we live in today. We don't just strike the kind of questioning that we considered earlier, but there's a refusal to accept that God will judge the world. It seems to be an odd juxtaposition that we live in a world which desperately wants justice, but without the judge. We want criminals to be judged, and we want justice to reign, but we don't want to be culpable or responsible for our own wrongdoing. We aren't keen on the idea of being held to account for our own sin. Even some churches today deny the doctrine of God's judgment to keep favour with the world. There are churches that deny that sin needs to be repented of to be turned away from. Sadly, in these places, the gospel has been watered down and grace has been cheapened. The idea that God is angry at sin and sinners for their deliberate rebellion is well and truly out of fashion, and the church in some places tries to affirm people as they are without any concept of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit changing us from the inside to make us more like the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're watching at home and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, dear friend, don't hear me saying that you're not welcome in the church. You are absolutely welcome to journey with us, to explore the gospel, to ask questions about God and Jesus, and you are welcome in all of your messiness because you're messy just like us. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be cleaned up people to be followers of Jesus. But if we're going to be Christians, we do need to accept that we must hold fast to his word, where he tells us that the wages of sin, that's what we deserve for our rebellion against God, the wages that we have earned by sinning, is death. We acknowledge that God will judge, and we throw ourselves on his mercy, knowing that he is faithful and just and will forgive us when we ask him to. We cannot, dear friends, we must not fall into the trap set by the devil to deny God's word which speaks of judgment, even if it's very uncomfortable. As Satan denies the certainty of God's judgment, he also holds out something very attractive to Eve. He brings an enticement. He offers Eve the opportunity to dethrone God and to crown herself in his place. What he does here is he attempts to reverse the created order. Instead of being creatures living in harmony with their creator, Eve can be the one who calls the shots. She can be self-sufficient. She can be all-knowing, knowing the difference between good and evil. And when she does that, she'll be able to make her own rules. There will be no submission required if she will just reach out and take and eat that fruit. The ability to be the master of her own destiny and to define for herself what is good and what isn't. That power to make the rules is almost akin to divinity and it's within Eve's grasp if she will just take that fruit and eat. It's an intoxicating offer. And it isn't just an offer that's an empty lie. It is full of venom and poison which lead to death. Eve is about to reach out and take charge, to grab the crown off God and to rule. 
the relationship with her creator, and the unashamed nakedness relationship with Adam. The life of purposeful work partnered with God all hangs in the balance. Do you see how Satan calls into question God's goodness by telling Eve that God is withholding something from her? He said, God knows that when you do this, we face the same temptation, don't we? The enemy's tactics haven't changed. He will come and he will show us something, something we desire, and he will cast doubt that God wants our very best. Why struggle financially when you can take a shortcut? Why feel lonely? Sleep with someone. Why feel awkward in social situations? Have another drink. He will work to convince us that God's way isn't a way characterized by love and goodness and mercy, but that it's restrictive and cruel, and that somehow we'll be missing out if we follow God's way instead. In verse 6, Adam and Eve trust the desires of their own hearts. The fruit looks good. And so Eve reaches out and takes the fruit and gulps it down. And Adam, who is right there with her, does exactly the same. Having received that warning, in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Adam does nothing to warn or correct or rebuke his wife. He's seen all of this unfold, and he shares equally with her in rebelling against God. In this one small action, their doubt that God's word is true, and their desire to rule over all the universe themselves changes everything forever. Next week we'll see the consequence of death entering into the world. Death both mortal as their bodies start to decay, and eternal as they are separated from their God after eating that fruit. We see in verse 7 that their eyes are opened. The horror of that moment is unimaginable. For the first time they know shame and fear and nakedness and misery. Their condition now sits in such stark contrast with their state of nakedness at the start of the chapter, where they felt no shame together whatsoever. Rejecting the word of God, the one who has created everything from nothing, and has immeasurably blessed humankind because of his great love, rejecting his word, they climb a rickety dais and sit on a throne of lies, wearing crowns that are as feeble and flimsy as the clothes that they make for themselves from leaves. In this moment, God's created perfect order has changed. The perfection that he completed would never be the same again. So how do we respond to this rebellion against God? Well, we've just seen the tactics of the devil. And we know that he has been defeated on the cross by the Lord Jesus. So we can take courage when we are tempted to question the plain meaning of the word of God. And we need to hold fast to it. When we are tempted to doubt that God's way is best for us, whether it's to do with money or family or relationships or business transactions or school results or any aspect of our lives, in those areas we will at times be presented with alternative ways to get what we think is better than what God says is good. And when that happens, dear brother or sister, take courage from the temptation that Jesus faced. When he was tempted by the devil, his response time and time again was to say, It is written. He came back to God's word. He absolutely 100% knew and trusted that the word of God revealed in the scriptures was good. Or consider his response to Peter. After Peter tries to convince Jesus that he couldn't possibly suffer and die for the sin of the world, Jesus responds, See, Peter couldn't handle the reality that what God had set ahead of Jesus was for his good. 
And Jesus turns and he rebukes Peter sharply and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus is able to shift the focus and to consider God's good purpose as he totally and 100% trusts in God. Now, I'm realistic. I know myself. I will fail. I fail every day. There are many times where I will give in to temptation and I will doubt and question the word of God. There are times where I'm going to put that crown on my own head. But what a hope we have in Jesus. That our failure, that our questioning the word of God is not the end. We can repent. We can come to God and ask for forgiveness and we can be restored. We can be strengthened as we look at his example and allow the Holy Spirit to bring to mind the word of God. When we are tempted to crown ourselves, to rebel and to climb onto a throne which isn't ours to sit on, then dear brother or sister, we must humble ourselves. Remember Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 11 which we worked through earlier in the year. Look there to the example of the Lord Jesus, who even though he was God, took on the lowly position of a slave. He died to self. He was obedient to his father, even to death on a cross. And when he had the opportunity to grasp what the devil offered him in that moment of temptation, he denied that desire and he sought God's way instead. As we live this life, as we come up against the temptations and the wiles of the devil, having a healthy view and a good understanding of Genesis 1 to 3 will help us greatly as we are reminded that we are loved and blessed by God, that we are made in his image, and that what he defines is good for his people. Why don't we pray and ask God to help us to hold fast to these truths? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all we have seen revealed to us in your word today. We pray that we would hold fast to the Lord Jesus, and that when the devil, the father of lies, entices us to question your word and your goodness, would you help us to recall your amazing promises revealed to us in the scriptures? In our moments of weakness, would you help us to respond like the Lord Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit? Would you help us to humble ourselves and trust in you and your word completely? We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.
And to conclude our time of prayer, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. So as Christ taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we've met together in this unusual way today, I'm conscious that for some of us, this will be a time of feeling really unsettled. Uh, Maybe we've got difficult memories of the last time that Aotearoa New Zealand was at level 4, which are difficult memories for us. If you're feeling apprehensive, then please do get in touch and let us know. As a staff team, as a church, we are here to walk together during this time. Now, we don't know how long this is going to last for, but as a church family, we do need to care for each other. We need to support one another because we are bound together by the love of God. So please, friends, don't hesitate to be in touch. There are going to be staff phone numbers on the screen for you after the service closes, so you can take a note of those. If you have any practical needs, then let us know, and we will help where we can. I want to encourage all of us as well during this time to keep connected with each other. Phone someone else from church, spend some time talking to each other. You could offer to pray for one another at the end of your call. Uh, Now that might be a bit new and a bit risky for some of us, but if the person on the other end of the phone seems a bit surprised or thinks you're a weirdo, then you can blame it on me. Uh, I've asked you to do that. Do offer to pray for one another. We have a wonderful opportunity before us to grow in the love of Christ as we care for each other during this time to the glory of God. I would love to see you on Zoom for a cup of tea after the service. We're going to catch up there and take some time to see each other, to touch base, and there'll be an opportunity for prayer there as well. Uh, The details for that will also be on the screen after the service. So to conclude, why don't we say the grace together? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. So go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. We go in the name of Christ. Have a great week.
I say, I will rest in your glorious grace. For the sun. 